directly go through details and the reason for that is uh, there have been few quite a few queries in the past about diathermy safety so it is also part of the electrical safety lecture uh, which I used to directly give so uh, first we'll start with the highway filters and I don't know how many of you would have noticed this and uh, the filters on IV fluid set. This is a simple uh, IV fluid giving set. And uh, some of them don't actually have these filters, but if you look at the bottom of the chamber, sometimes you actually see a, a covering. You can't see the hole directly. So this is actually a filter. Okay, so this is an IV filter. And uh, this is 15 micron filter. Okay, it's not very clearly seen here, uh, but this is a 15 micron uh, filter. This is a fluid warmer uh, with the cartridge. And this one is actually a high volume set. And this comes with this kind of a filter. Normal ones don't actually have this filter. But this one actually do have a filter. And these filters are of 0.2 micrometers. Now 0.2 micrometers is 200 nanometers. Okay, so that is a bacterial and a viral filter, both. Okay. And the size of uh, the virus is, is around 220 nanometers to 400 nanometers that is 0.4 micrometers and this is 0.2 micrometers so this will likely provide some amount of viral uh, filtration as well all of you are aware of this filter this is an epidural filter which is attached to a epidural uh, catheter and uh, this is again a 0.2 micrometer uh, filter so again that is 200 nanometers so this is both a viral bacterial filter some of the needles actually come with filters and you will actually see this is one of the needles growing up needles and this is a hypodermic needle actually and uh, if you look closely, you can actually see inside there is actually a depth filter in it. So it's actually uh, a filter needle. But if you look at the top one, the one with the red thing, it hasn't got anything. This is this does not have any filter. It's just a simple drawing up thing. But I have actually attached a filter. No, no, that's not a filter. That's actually a syringe attached to it. But you can attach a separate filter if you want to it as well. So the green one, which is there in the center on which points to the arrow, if you move the arrow to the right, okay, you will actually see that there's a white thing inside that has actually got a filter as well. And uh, this is a uh, part of the epidural kit. And the needle that is um, pointing to that is used for drawing up local anesthetic actually is also a filter needle. So that is also important, especially if you're drawing up uh, medicines from a you know a broken vial which might actually not only actually you know be contaminated but uh, with the glass particles uh, but you know you also have prevent bacterial and viral so these are actually uh, quite good filters then we have this blood giving uh, set there you can actually see two filters and there is one conical one on the top and there is actually a normal blood giving set on the bottom okay both of this actually are different size filters and if you look at the filter which is a blood giving set filter it is 120 to 140 micrometer filter whereas on the top is actually a filter uh, which is of 40 micrometers so it's much much uh, in a finer filter than the one we have uh, in the uh, blood giving set. Now the blood giving set actually this filter you can actually see the holes if you actually look at them closely you can see the holes uh, within the filter 
and uh, this is basically to collect uh, the uh, the uh, red cells which actually have brulet uh, which have stuck to each other so that they have formed clots and uh, that's what it is used for and uh, what is the other filter used for we will talk in a minute okay so these are stream filters and this is a close-up look at the filter and uh, you can actually see it looks like it's got a depth but still it is called a screen filter and the reason for that is because what you see inside the, the filter part is just a sheet and that's why it's like a screen and all it's done is it's actually folded into a concertina uh, to increase the surface area so it looks as if it's a depth filter but it's not a depth filter it's just a screen filter uh, which occupies a larger space and uh, the surface area has been increased by uh, putting into a pleat, pleat cell and into like a concertina like like this so uh, this is a screen filter so it's a pleated polyester uh, filter yeah this is an interesting filter and it is asked in the exam is shown in exams a large disc type filter and uh, I'll show you one side, that's the other side of it. And on the other side, it does mention that this is actually a leukocyte filter. Okay. And uh, to be used with salvaged blood. Okay. So uh, this is by uh, Hemonetics, uh, which is the company use. Uh, <clears throat> and this is uh, another company filter. This is by PAL. And this is also a leukocyte uh, filter. It's exactly the same. And it is a large disc shaped filter. And uh, say, like I said, it is used uh, with the uh, uh, blood uh, which has been collected, which has been cell saved, salvaged, or cell saved. The blood which is cell saved is actually uh, from a site which might have other debris, it might actually have bone uh, particles, it could actually have uh, fat, it could have. Uh, you know other stuff in it so it is uh, washed uh, centrifuge washed and then it is collected into a bag which you can see on the right side and then it is actually run through this uh, filter the leukocyte filter uh, so this is uh, a leukocyte filter the leukocyte filter is also a screen filter and it has got a very fine pore size so it is five to six micrometers uh, so it has got both uh, the bacterial and viral properties and uh, this removes the activated leukocytes uh, as well as uh, red cells because when you are actually uh, you know uh, filtering the uh, you know the blood obviously the, the rbc's have to pass through uh, but uh, then uh, it will also retain around 10 percent of the rbc's it will not only retain the leukocytes but you would also actually have so that means that you might actually have to change it more frequently now you would actually say that the filter the pore size is five to six micron where the right rbc's are six to eight microns but we also know and um, that the rbc's are not rigid cells so they can actually pass through finer pores so that's why it is able to actually filter out rbc's but it will still retain our 10 percent of our species will still be retained by that and so the removal of the leukocytes is by barrier retention and also by direct uh, adsorption and it is because of this adsorption that RBCs will, RBCs will be also be removed or stuck uh, in this filter so it is very efficient but it will slow down the filtration rate so if you look at classification of filters plus filters are classified into uh, screen filters and depth filters and we have seen that so the blood giving set filters uh, these are 120 to 140 microns and the uh, PAL blood uh, filter that is the the uh, you know the uh, conical uh, side uh, filter which we were seeing attached in the first image that has got a 40 micron filters now the IV filters uh, uh, can come uh, without uh, air filters and they actually have a size of 50 uh, micrometers uh, with the uh, air filters is 0.2 micrometers so that was the one I was showing you along with the uh, cartridge uh, fluid warmer cartridge 
uh, that had this filters uh, uh, with a fast queuing uh, fluid queuing set. So that has got a, a size of 0.2 micrometers. Epidural filters are also screen filters, 0.2 micrometers. There are depth filters as well. Uh, depth filters are basically made of dichron fibers and they're like packed into a cylindrical kind of thing. And um, it is similar to what you have in a, in a neural filter. And uh, these uh, filters can be anywhere from five micrometers to 10 micrometers. So if you look at the size of uh, various uh, things that these, fil these filters will filter out, so the smallest is a virus, which is uh, 20 to 400 nanometers. Uh, so that means from 0 0.02 uh, to 0 0.4 micrometers. So not all viruses uh, will be filtered by the bacterial viral filters. Uh, bacteria can be cocci or bacilli, and uh, so the diameter of a bacteria can be anywhere from 0.2 to 5 micrometers and the bacilli will also have a length of around 3 to 5 micrometers. Platelets are larger than bacteria, so they are 2 to 3 micrometers. RBCs, we know it is around 7.2 to 7.4 microns, or on average 6 to 8 micrometers in size. And the largest of them is the leukocyte, which is 8 to 12 micrometers. And you've seen the leukocyte filters you just saw that. So this is the size you need to know in the ascending order or descending order, the SARS in the exams. Coming to HMEs, uh, so uh, humidifiers and moisture exchangers. And so this is the simplest of the kinds, so the first generation. And this is also known as a Swedish nose. And uh, initially it was actually made of paper, folded paper. Uh, but you can also have made of wire, you can have made of sponge, uh, you can make it made of uh, paper coated with uh, calcium chloride or lithium chloride. So it, it exactly has evolved over the time. But uh, the initial ones were simple sponge, actually just a sponge. Uh, they were attached to the tracheostomies uh, and they, this one actually also got attachment for uh, oxygen. Uh, so you can also have a little bit of oxygen going through uh, that. And uh, these are disposable. Uh, after around a few hours, uh, you can actually change them. Otherwise, they get uh, clogged with water, and you need to actually uh, then uh, you know, change it because it makes breathing difficult, increase the work of breathing. But this is a simple humidifier, uh, the first generation uh, HME. And you can actually see all it has is a sponge on it, but it says HMEF uh, 1000. Uh, so it must have some amount of uh, the uh, filtration properties as well. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, shown in a, uh, attached to a breathing circuit. You can also see that there is attachment for uh, gas sampling, uh, which is attached to so and so monitoring the end total CO2 as well as for monitoring the anesthetic gases. And this is another filter, and uh, yeah, can, you can see that this has got a pleated uh, paper, folded paper. Uh, but when you look at closely, it has actually got a metal. You can sh uh, see the shining uh, metal, uh, which help, actually helps to hold the heat as well. So uh, this is a old type of uh, the humidifier, uh, and then this one is actually trans transparent. You could actually see uh, see the uh, you know uh, all the components of the HME can also be seen in that. So if you look at the uh, uh, first generation, uh, the HMEs, uh, they were hygroscopic uh, filters, hygroscopic uh, because they could actually hold water. Okay. They were made of either wool, uh, foam, or uh, pleated paper. And uh, they could be actually coated with uh, lithium chloride or calcium chloride. And uh, the second generation uh, once also actually had a electrolyte uh, felt filter as well uh, as a layer as well. And uh, then there are hydrophobic pleated membranes, okay, 
as uh, so this is hydrophobic uh, HMEF and you would actually think that why would we need a hydrophobic one because you want the uh, filters to actually hold water so that they can be heated and humidified. Uh, the principle is very simple. They are equally efficient. It's like uh, when you actually pour water, a thin layer of, on a glass, you can actually see a thin layer of water that actually get, uh, you know, distributed evenly. So similar kind of thing is actually used in this hydrophobic filter as well. So this thin layer of uh, the uh, water can be uh, used for humidification. So uh, there are, the filters can be both hydroscopic as well hydrophobic. So how do these filters actually work? So they can be by direct interception. Okay, so as the you know, particles pass through this, they actually just hold it because they do not allow the pore size is so small that they just get directly intercepted. Then they can be by inertial interception because they hit the fibers and then actually hit another one. And in this way, uh, the movement of the particles is actually uh, reduced and they get trapped uh, in between. So that is by the inertial interception. And then uh, there is something called diffusional interception. Again, so particles uh, are held by electrostatic interaction uh, between it and the charges which are held by the components of which the filters are made with. So these are three types uh, by which the filtration actually happens. So if you look at classification of HMEs, they can be simple condensers. So, okay, so this is like the Swedish nose, uh, which can be made of wire mesh. They could be made of sponge. It could be uh, where, even made of uh, the paper mesh as well. Then there are hydroscopic and hydrophobic filters. And I told you about that. The hydroscopic one uh, tend to absorb water. And so these can be paper coated with calcium chloride or it can be also made of glass fiber or poly uh, polypropylene uh, which are coated with lithium chloride. Uh, so this actually helps to retain water. But they can also be made of the hydrophobic, uh, uh, these are folded ceramic fibers uh, which are folded and depleted into, uh, you know, to form uh, the filters. Uh, and both these hydroscopic and hydrophobic are very, very efficient and they pro provide biological barrier uh, to bacteria and to viruses as well. So uh, this is one classification. Other classification of filters is based on whether they actually have uh, bacterial water filtration properties or not. So you can actually have uh, the filters on HMEs as HMEs only. So they just are for humidification uh, and uh, filtration uh, for basically holding the moisture and humidifying uh, the gases. Then you can actually have the filters only. Uh, they do not actually have any humidification properties. And uh, they do filtration by electrostatic uh, um, in a method, which I've just described. And these are usually made of uh, pleated uh, hydrophobic uh, material. Uh, but most of us actually use a combined uh, HME and filters. So this is, uh, that's why they call HMEF. And these can be electrostatic or uh, pleated hydrophobic. Again, I have already explained to you. So this is the basic classification of HME. So that was the easy part. And now we are going to come to the difficult part. And the first part is the defibrillators. I will talk about circuit and uh, various waveforms. And these are again asked in the exams. So defibrillator, as like I said, it's, it is a very useful device. Uh, you use it for defibrillating patients, uh, patients who have gone into VF, okay, uh, in a in a unstable rhythm, okay, or shockable rhythm. Uh, you use it for very use, but they are also uh, dangerous in a form of that they actually uh, have very huge energy and uh, uh, use high, very high voltage. Uh, so if you look at the uh, circuit of a defibrillator uh, what we have we obviously have uh, the left side of the circuit uh, is the charging circuit uh, which has got a diode diode allows the current to flow in only in one direction and then you have a capacitor those uh, parallel plates and that's that's the uh, parallel plate okay that is exactly the capacitor okay so in the first part 
So that's the first power circuit. This is the one it is attached to 240 volts. And when you actually have it on the charging mode, so you actually have a charging mode, you switch on charging, what is going to happen is that this part, okay, that is uh, the capacitor is going to actually charge. So we were using only 240 volts. How did it get to uh, 2000 volt potential? So obviously on that side, uh, there is a step up transformer. So it steps up the voltage from 240 volts to 8000 volts, and it can go up to 20,000 volts. So that is uh, what is required to actually charge uh, the capacitor. So when this is charging, the capacitor holds the charge. And then once that is charged, we will apply the pedal across the heart. Okay. And say everybody stand by. Okay. Everybody move away. And uh, then we actually go on to the charge. We have to press the both pedal switches on the pedals. Okay. And the current is actually delivered. The energy is delivered across the heart. And once it is actually delivered, at least delivered, and if you're lucky, you would actually start uh, converting uh, these shockable rhythm um, uh, into a uh, more uh, sustained normal rhythm, sinus rhythm. Uh, so uh, this is how the differentiator works. Now, if you look in the circuit, there is also something called an inductor. So when inductor and a, a capacitor are in series, and uh, they actually, uh, you know, uh, then you know, causes this, uh, the whole, if they, they uh, form something called an oscillator. So uh, as the uh, capacitor is discharged, uh, it will actually charge the inductor. Inductor holds the energy in the form of magnetic field. And this will then again charge the capacitor again. And the capacitor uh, will actually then deliver the charge to the heart. And this goes on in circle till the whole energy dies down. Okay, so uh, they, this is an oscillator circuit. Okay. So if you look at the energy uh, that is stored in a capacitor, as you apply the voltage, the energy comes up to the top. So the energy stored is a product of the charge and the voltage. And uh, so the area, if you look at the area, which is the work done, it is half of uh, the whole thing. Okay. So uh, area of work is half of QV. And since the Q is equal to CV, and if we actually uh, now uh, replace the Q in that, we become half CV square. Okay. The capacitor which is in the uh, defibrillator is only one microfarad, micro 10 to the power of minus six. Okay. Energy we deliver is half CV square. So if we actually have to deliver 200 joules, uh, that will be half of one microfarad, that is 10 to the power of minus six V square. And if we rearrange it, uh, then it becomes 200 into two into 10 to the power of six is equal V square. And so V is equal to square root of, yes, right. So the 4 million volts square root, that is 20,000 volts. Okay, so to deliver 2,000 joules energy, we actually require 20,000 volts. And that is where the dangerous energy actually lies. So you can imagine if somebody actually touches 20,000 volts, what would happen to him? So there is a huge, huge energy. And that's why even though they are actually great piece of equipment, uh, which save life, they can become a danger as well. So the energy in the old uh, uh, defibrillators, they were called monophasic defibrillators, and uh, the waveform was that uh, that will actually quickly uh, deliver the current applied over uh, just around eight milliseconds. Okay. And the energy is applied on the chest Okay, and uh, then you have the skin. There is uh, obviously uh, the resistance through which this uh, energy has to pass through the muscle, the bones, and uh, if there is air in the lung, the lung will absorb some amount of energy. And in the end, the energy will be delivered 
uh, to the heart. So the first shock when we deliver, uh, so we used to say deliver 200, 200, 360. So the 200, 200 joules, which are actually first delivered, uh, so reduce the impedance, the resistance to which to the current passes through, that was reduced by the initial uh, energy. And then when the third shock was delivered, and that energy was actually delivered to the heart, and that's how it worked. So you could actually deliver all energy only by giving the third shock. So we were losing a lot of amount of energy uh, within the tissues, and the amount that was delivered to the uh, heart uh, were very, very uh, small. Because if you look at it, if you actually had to do an open heart surgery, you don't require anything more than 20 joules uh, to uh, defibrillate uh, the heart. But when you're applying the energy, uh, from the chest or monophasic, you would actually require energy as high as 360 joules. So the waveform which is uh, used uh, for the monophasic is called damped sine waveform. It is damped because you have seen the energy actually is stored in the capacitor, passes through the heart and tissues, goes through the in, uh, inductor and back to the capacitor and slowly get damped and that's why you get this kind of waveform. Uh, so this is called a damp sand waveform uh, for that. But the modern defibrillator are biphasic defibrillators. Okay, they require less amount of energy to be delivered, uh, and you can see the energy is delivered in the positive direction and the negative direction as well. And you can actually see that it's not just six to eight milliseconds. Now the energy is delivered over a longer period of a time, and because delivered over a longer period of time. The energy can actually reach the heart uh, much more efficiently. Okay. So this is one form of the uh, biphasic. This is called the truncated exponential form. So this is a biphasic truncated exponential. And this is used by the smart defibrillator made by Philips. And it is used in patients who have very high impedance uh, uh, to that. So patients who actually are very muscular, obese, uh, have a lot of tissues, uh, this kind of waveform is a good waveform. Then there is another waveform. This is called a rectilinear uh, biphasic waveform. This is uh, by the Zoll. Zoll and another company which makes that. And this is actually, you can see that it is rectilinear. So the uh, waveform is delivered. The first part of the energy is delivered around uh, 6 to 8 uh, milliseconds. Uh, this is rectilinear. And this works very well for uh, low impedance. So it's okay. For normal built patients or patients who do not have much tissues between the pad and the heart. So this actually works uh, very well in that. So these are uh, the circuits for uh, the biphasic uh, uh, defibrillators is, uh, is actually different for different and they, uh, they have released. But you can actually see that the current actually flows between positive to negative. So it must be going back and forth uh, between the heart and the pedals. Coming to the last part of the lecture is on surgical diathermy. So if you look at uh, diathermy, it actually uses a very high frequency current. So normal current is at around 50 hertz and uh, this is at, at 300 kilohertz, 300,000 hertz, okay, so 3 lakhs hertz or 3, 3 megahertz, uh, 310 to the power 6 hertz. And the current flow through the patient is anywhere from 200 to 400 milliamps. And uh, in uh, the uh, uh, urology where we use combination of uh, the uh, uh, different waveforms, it's called a blend. Uh, in those, it can be as much as 2 amperes, okay, 2 amps. <laughs> So we actually uh, use uh, high frequency oscillations uh, with the sine wave patterns for cutting and uh, most of low frequency or it's called damped or pulse sine wave forms are used for coagulation. Now you would actually wonder so the answer to why 50 hertz is a dangerous frequency whereas high frequency actually form uh, without um, you know any problem. They, they actually cause heating effect. And that's because as the frequency increases, the heating effect 
increases. Whereas the 50 hertz, 50 to 60 hertz, uh, that is actually within the natural frequency of the heart. So heart beats at one hertz okay, per second. Okay, so that actually correlates very well with that. So uh, it becomes a dangerous frequency. Uh, whereas uh, with diathermies, uh, it is the very high frequency. And uh, with high frequency, the current can pass through the body without uh, causing any harm except for that at the point it will cause heating okay so uh, diathermic waveform sine waveform this is actually used uh, for cutting okay so this is this is the sine waveform and uh, used for cutting now if we look at the uh, intermittent uh, damps sine wave uh, this is used for coagulation you can actually see that when you are using uh, you know the cutting it is a continuous uh, whereas coagulation is usually used in small bursts. But when you actually uh, bring this uh, closer to each other as a continuous form, and then it becomes mm -hmm. becomes a blend. Okay. So this is uh, a blend uh, where it is similar to the coagulation waveform, uh, but it is continuous. It's not, not interrupted uh, like for coagulation. So uh, this is a, a coagulation. Uh, a blend so that's used in in the urology uh, for TURP or transurethral resection of uh, the bladder tumors there are other terms we need to know is uh, is is difference between desiccation and coagulation so coagulation is when used on low power uh, causes desiccation okay uh, desiccation is basically relatively slow drying out of the tissues and it does not produce any any spark at all okay. then uh, the fulguration uh, when coagulation is used with very high power setting and uh, that it generates sparks it, it causes uh, intermittent heating of the tissue uh, this causes the cells to dry quickly and almost like explode into a uh, steam so this is called fulguration so coagulation used with low power is desiccation uh, coagulation when, when used with high power setting uh, is, is uh, fulguration. Okay. So what are these power settings? So we know that power is uh, current uh, square of the current times the resistance or P is equal to I square R. And so uh, when uh, you have higher current uh, with uh, the higher resistance, you require high power settings. So low power settings, less than 30 watts, uh, used in dermatology. Uh, so when I say, uh, the surgeon say, can I actually have the setting on 30? I can have 40, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the power he wants to use. So low power, less than 30 watts, is used for dermatology. It's used for laparoscopic, both monopolar, bipolar. Again, neurosurgery, again, monopolar, bipolar is less than 30. Uh, any surgery in the mouth, oral surgeries, plastic surgery, vasectomies, you require very low power. You require less than 30 watts. Okay. Medium power, so if you want to use for cutting, then it's 30 to 100 uh, watts. For coagulation, it's 30 to 70 watts. Okay. And uh, this is the settings which you will actually normally see. The surgeon will say, I want it 40 40. Okay, so 40 40, when he's saying 40 40, he's saying that he wants 40 for cutting and 40 for coagulation. And sometimes he might actually say, can you increase the cutting a little bit more? And when he's using through that, so he'll say, oh, can you increase it from 40 to 60? And uh, so that is basically the power. He's asking you to actually raise the power. So this is used in general surgery, head and neck surgeries for ENT, uh, for laparotomies and orthopedic surgeries, uh, thoracic and vascular surgery. Here, you would be actually cutting through the you know, tissues with muscles and bones. Well, bones you don't cut through uh, with the thing, but at least uh, when you are actually going through, uh, like doing a thoracotomy, uh, then you would actually use that. Or when you're cutting through the muscles, your rectus muscle, then that's what it's used for. So medium power is used for that. High power cutting is anywhere about 100 uh, watts, uh, coagulation more than 70 watts. So this is very high power setting. And this is normally used in ablative cancer surgeries like for uh, mastectomy they can use for cutting at 180 to 200 watts uh, coagulation 70 to 120 watts can be used in uh, thoracotomies uh, especially when they're going through the muscle uh, you know they can use heavy fulguration between 70 to 120 watts 
and transurethral resection of prostate and for cancer, mostly cancer, mostly cutting is, uh, the setting is around 100 to 170 volts and coagulation is 70 to 120 volts. And transurethral resections, uh, when I said that, they are normally using a combination energy. So uh, that's just why it's called, a, I'll call it blend. So coming to how uh, the diatonic work, it's very, very simple. You have got an electrode, you got a plate. The current flows between the electrode, your pen and the uh, plate. And uh, where it touches, that is a high density. And then it disperses off uh, at the plate end. And that's where the uh, high density current is formed. At the low density of the plate, then the current flows back to the machine from the circuit. So the current is actually flowing between the active electrode and the indifferent electrode, which is the plate. And <coughs> the plate can be then be connected uh, in the machine in various ways. And this is where the first generation, second generation, and third generation machine comes in. Okay. In the first generation machines, uh, it was connected directly. The plate was connected directly to the earth. Then there were some issues, which I will explain. Uh, why it became a dangerous thing and then they introduced something called isolation capacitors within the machine and the present machines this is the third generation machines uh, which actually use a isolated circuit okay. so this is this is how it was the initial first order of uh, the first generation machine looked like You had the active electrode, then you had an indifferent plate. Okay, the current flow between the two. Hmm. Right, there was heating at there. Okay, so as long as as long as uh, the circuit was complete, it was no problem. Okay, so where did the problem actually arise then? Uh, this is this is a, a bipolar diatom. You know that the current actually flows from between the two electrodes. You don't need a plate for a bipolar diatom. So that was a monopolar, and this is a bipolar. Okay. Yeah. So the plate, the plate in the first generation, uh, you would see that the plate was actually earth, and the thought that when the current flows, any current which does not pass through uh, can actually flow to the earth, and uh, so should not cause any problem but they still happen. So what would happen if the plate became dislodged or was partly connected? Okay. First of all, a small part of thing, and uh, there can be, now the heating is not only happening at the tip of the active electrode, but heating is also happening at the point where the plate is just touching because the current density is same as it is actually at the tip or you have increased the current density and increased that and that's how the burns at the plate side actually happen and how does it call other problems as well so you have got a patient who is connected to a monitor so some of this uh, energy can also actually flow uh, through the ECG and obviously it can actually cause disturbances as well. The current can actually flow flow to the earth because many of these machines were earth as well. Okay. But if you actually had a patient who had an intracardiac catheter, in that case the energy could actually flow uh, through the catheter and you could actually cause harm. So patient could actually have something like a micro shock you don't require a uh, much energy to actually cause a micro shock when it's just it delivered directly at the heart level okay so this is good call and they say well this is not good okay let's let's actually uh, prevent this current actually flowing uh, through the earth so they introduce a isolating capacitor within the circuit so this was a second generation uh, machine right okay so it's a second generation diatomy machine uh, say so they introduce a capacitor of 0 0.01 microfarad and uh, at a diatomy frequency this actually had a resistance of 20 ohms 
Uh, whereas at with low frequency, okay, it's huge amount of resistance. It's 300,000 300, ohms. So it won't allow the current that is the 50 to 60 hertz current, and I have explained this, that 50 to 60 hertz uh, current, which is actually the current, uh, the frequency uh, at which the household uh, electricity is supplied, that is a dangerous frequency. And so this won't be allowed. So the 50 to 60 hertz uh, frequency could not pass through. So it would allow uh, the high frequency uh, current, so the uh, 300 uh, kilohertz or three megahertz frequency could pass through this capacitor, but uh, the 50 to 60 hertz cannot pass through. So this is what they did. Okay, so they took this off and actually introduced an isolation capacitor uh, within the uh, plate. Uh, so from the plate to the diathermy, the returning electrode, they introduce a capacitor of 0 0.01 uh, microfarad. So how did this actually prevent prevent this to actually happen? Okay. So let's actually look at it. So when the current actually was trying to flow through the heart, okay, this is uh, from the your monitors, uh, which is actually at 50 to 60 hertz. Now this would actually stop at the capacitor. So no current actually could pass through this capacitor and hence it was made safe, okay, right? Whereas the uh, diathermy frequencies, which is at 300 uh, kilohertz to three megahertz, that could actually pass very easily through it because this capacitor allows high frequency to pass through, but they cause resistance, very high resistance, almost 300,000 ohms uh, resistance to the frequency of 50 to 60 hertz so that one but this would pass and it would actually function as normal so that was actually considered fantastic it said that's really really good that this will not happen but did it actually prevent that no when the uh, the uh, diathermy plate was uh, you know partially uh, uh, connected to the patient and uh, in that case the current could still flow so it could actually flow from the diathermy onto the, uh, uh, you know, through the machine to the earth and back. Okay, so it didn't. So next step in the safety of diathermy was to introduce something called a floating circuit. Okay, floating circuits do not rely on earth at all. So if you take off the earth, the earth, so in this case is the Problem was the earth and the isolation capacitor, which was introduced uh, into the earth circuit, actually did not actually protect uh, the machine or the patient. Okay. So then they uh, uh, they have uh, something called the isolated diathermy. Okay, isolated diathermy actually uses a floating circuit. So what you have is a kind of a transformer uh, in which. Uh, the secondary circuit, so the primary circuit is the uh, one on the right side of the diathermy. Uh, the secondary circuit, uh, the uh, you are inducting using a inductors, and so now you actually have the electrodes uh, passing between the secondary coil. Okay. So primary coil is attached to the earth, but the secondary coil has no attachment. So it's very simple, and uh, that if the uh, uh, if there is any disconnection at all, it will stop working because there is no, the current cannot actually flow through anywhere as well. So uh, there is no contact and no current actually flows. The other thing which have been introduced in the modern diathermy is that the indifferent plate have something called plate monitors. So if you look at the uh, newer diathermy plates, it actually has got two pads. So what it does is that it is not only, um, you know, uh, causing this, this is like the completion of a circuit, but it also actually monitors the impedance between the two plates. At any stage, uh, there is uh, a disconnection at any other plates, you will actually hear uh, the alarm. So the alarm will go on. You will actually see the light alarm, and uh, you will actually see a visual as well as audio alarms in there. Okay. So 
this was there and the last part is, is diathermy and uh, pacemakers and the dangers and precautions so uh, if we actually have a pacemaker unit and uh, the current actually passes through it it can actually cause harm it actually can cause heating effect and uh, uh, we have discussed this in the uh, uh, in the lecture and on pacemakers uh, so it can actually cause heating effect the sensing electrode or the sensing element of the pacemakers can also be damaged so the current the current should not actually pass through the heart so if you actually are doing a surgery on the chest the plate cannot be uh, kept uh, on the back and uh, you actually uh, use uh, diathermy on that region and again if you are actually operating away from it the plate need to be uh, far from the pacemaker unit it should not come in anywhere in the uh, circuit of the diaphragm okay. so uh, the to avoid interference uh, it will obviously like i've explained uh, the pacemaker circuit uh, uh, need to be shielded uh, which is actually very good most of the modern uh, pacemaker circuits are well shielded and uh, the proximity uh, of the uh, your pad, the, uh, the earth pad, need to be away. So you need to be as far away from that unit as possible. And the next thing is to actually not use unipolar diathermy at all, because then you don't need that pad uh, at all. In the, uh, if you're not using uni unipolar, uh, you can just use uh, monopolar diathermy. There are problems with uh, capacitive uh, coupling and uh, uh, you can actually, uh, you know, turn off uh, any pacemaker uh, before using it because this uh, capacitive coupling uh, can affect the programming on the pacemaker, and uh, this can actually result in complete heart block, no pacing, or even uh, severe tachycardia. So, in certain, uh, uh, you know, situation where you have to use this, uh, despite being away from the uh, the pacemaker unit. You can still cause uh, capacitive uh, coupling uh, within the unit. Uh, this is more with the older ones uh, rather than the newer pacemaker. So we need to be actually be uh, you know prepared to reset a pacemaker to asynchronous mode, and uh, sometimes this can be done uh, with uh, using a magnet. Uh, other times it's important that we consult the cardiologist and the electrophysiological labs uh, so that uh, appropriate arrangements. Uh, uh, can be made. Uh, some of the pacemakers are very complex and uh, that's why we need to involve the cardiologist and the uh, uh, in the cardiorespiratory uh, labs uh, who will set the uh, pacemakers to whatever it is. Um, sometimes you might need to actually prepare isoprenaline. Uh, concentration is one microgram per ml and you can use a small bolus of uh, infusion. Uh, it is called a chemical uh, cardiodefibrillator. Uh, but I've never used it, uh, but it is available to us. Uh, this is only in, in very rare, rare situations. Okay. So as far as diathermy and pacemaker are concerned, uh, avoid diathermy as far as possible. Uh, if you need to use, use bipolar. And if you are using monopolar, uh, place the plate uh, distant from the pacemaker as far as possible. And uh, do not apply the current across the chest and so make sure that uh, the uh, pacing wires or the uh, unit is not in the path of the uh, flow of current at all and if you are using it make sure that the standard duration are at least short very short burst okay so do not allow them to use cutting for cutting uh, tell them to use coagulation coagulation again uh, with uh, very low power is uh, actually good so with this uh, we actually finish the lecture and uh, thank you for listening. Uh, any questions, uh, we will take as they come. And uh, this video will also be available to you uh, on the uh, Facebook uh, because this will be saved there. Uh, so you can actually watch it uh, anytime.